wonderful person, this is Anton, and once again we have a new record holder. This tiny red blob you see right here, that's the most distant galaxy ever found, as of April of 2022. And it comes to us only weeks after the discovery of the farthest star we've ever seen, known as Arendelle, that I've discussed in a video that you can find somewhere right there or in the description below. And so in this video, let's actually discuss exactly what this galaxy represents, what it means for our understanding of the formation of the universe, talk a little bit about why this galaxy was discovered to be really strange and somewhat difficult to explain, and also talk about the previous discovery, which I'm going to start with right now. So a couple of years ago, we've talked about a galaxy known as GNZ11, or Z11 for those of you in Canada. Z11 in this case represents the so-called redshift. In this case, this galaxy possessed the redshift of 11, and because of the distances involved here, the only reasonable way of measuring how far away these galaxies are is by essentially measuring the redshift of various ultraviolet emissions usually coming from the formation of different stars. So let me demonstrate how all of this works. What you're looking at right here are various galaxies very close to the Milky Way. And if I were to start zooming in here, at some point I would start seeing galaxies that are extremely redshifted. They're going to appear extremely red. So for example, here's one such distant red galaxy. Now the redshift in this case is obviously due to the distances, but all of the light that used to be optical, basically the light that we can receive with our own eyes, has now actually become infrared. So it would not really be visible to us. What we are seeing, however, is actually ultraviolet light. The frequency of light that's not visible to the human eye, but because of the distances traveled, has now become other frequency that we cannot see. Very, very long infrared waves. And generally, by identifying the exact redshift, the scientists can then estimate distances. And so this previous record holder, GNZ11, was the highest redshift galaxy ever found, located in the constellation of Ursa Major. And when it was originally discovered, it was definitely the oldest galaxy known to us. Here's roughly what this galaxy might actually look like based on some of the observations. The images that we detected from it came from approximately 13.4 billion years ago, when the universe was only 400 million years old with the rough estimate of distances between Earth and this galaxy being about 32 billion years. In this case, it's not 13.4 billion light years, simply because the universe is also expanding as the light travels. And back when it was discovered, it was also assumed to be basically at the limit of the capabilities of modern telescopes, including Hubble telescope. It was more or less located so far away that we really shouldn't even be seeing anything coming from here. In some sense, this was already a bit of an anomaly. And on top of this, it was also in that period of time known as Reionization Era, during the period known as the Cosmic Dawn. The period of time when the universe was pretty much almost entirely dark, because there was not enough light produced by anything, and most of the gas in between galaxies, or between early galaxies, was essentially neutral hydrogen, which didn't really allow for a lot of light to pass. And so we call this the Dark Ages, and this particular period slowly started to transform the universe and reionize all of this gas, creating what we have today, the universe that we sort of understand and know very well. But all of this took some time, almost a billion years. And even this discovery was very close to the so-called Dark Ages. We don't expect much light from this region. This galaxy was already 150 million years older than the previous record holder. The galaxy you see right there, known as EGS Y8P7. But it was detected, and it was not even that unusual. As a matter of fact, a lot of things about this galaxy kind of made sense. The stars here in the galaxy itself were approximately 40 million years old, it was about 1 25th the size of the Milky Way, and only possessed about 1% of the total mass of the Milky Way. But it was a rapidly growing galaxy, producing stars extremely quickly. With the galaxy very likely looking something like this, a typical small starburst galaxy. But this time, the scientists identified something that they cannot actually explain very well. They found two more potential galaxies, even farther away, even younger, located at the redshift of 13.3, which is about 70 million years before GNZ11, or approximately 330 million years after the universe began. 
And generally it's believed that during that period, well, there were probably not a lot of galaxies out there, if any. The stars were just kind of starting and they were just clumping together. This was literally the beginning of the cosmic dawn. And on top of this, all of the previous detections using the most powerful telescopes, including Hubble, have actually failed to find anything that far. But that's of course because Hubble is not the best telescope when it comes to infrared observations. That title is going to belong to James Webb Telescope when it becomes fully operational. And so for this study, the scientists used the data from four different infrared surveys and telescopes, including the Subaru Telescope, the Visible and Infrared Survey Telescope for Astronomy, United Kingdom Infrared Telescope, and NASA's Spitzer Space Telescope as well. And then essentially combined approximately 1200 hours of observation time from these four different telescopes looking at one particular spot. In this case, looking for what's known as the Lyman Bray galaxies, the galaxies with a lot of star production on the inside that usually produce very specific types of frequencies. And in the process, they analyzed approximately 700,000 different objects, discovering two interesting candidates. The galaxy they refer to as HD1 at the redshift of 13.3 and the one known as HD2 slightly closer at 12.3. And they did so by knowing exactly what frequencies they should be detecting, assuming a certain redshift at a certain location. And in this case, they found the frequencies they were looking for, which were then discovered to be these particular galaxies, with HD1 being the farthest with the approximate distance of this galaxy from planet Earth being about 33.5 billion light years away from us. But, as I mentioned in the beginning, this galaxy is not without mysteries. It seems to be unusually bright in the ultraviolet wavelengths, which actually suggests that it's extremely energetic. Something extremely active is happening in this galaxy, and it's currently not something we can explain. So, for example, based on the preliminary calculations, if this is a so-called starburst galaxy, similar to GNZ11 that I discussed previously, it would require this galaxy to be at least 10 times more active. It would be producing approximately 100 masses of the Sun per year, which would be almost impossible to explain using modern science. This galaxy here was producing at least 10 times less. On the other hand, if it's not a starburst galaxy but some sort of an extremely powerful quasar, or basically if all of this ultraviolet light is produced through the activity of some kind of a central black hole and astrophysical jets, in this case, once again, the actual jets are way too bright. It would require a supermassive black hole at least 100 million masses of the Sun, and we don't expect such black holes to exist so early in the universe. Currently, there's really no explanation for how such a massive black hole could exist so early after the creation of the universe itself. And so, if not an active starburst galaxy, and if not a superactive quasar, how exactly is it able to produce so much energy? Way more energy than expected at this period of time. Well, right now the scientists only have one potential explanation, although I'm sure more will come with time. The explanation here is in regards to the types of stars we believe existed in this early universe, so-called population 3 stars. They don't actually exist anymore because all of them sort of went supernova and created population 2 and population 1 stars, but in essence these would be extremely bright, extremely massive and very powerful stars, potentially producing way more UV light than normal stars, and by producing more UV light they could technically explain what we're seeing here. So in other words, the explanation here is that, well, maybe the stars were actually very different back then. Maybe they were just much more powerful than we imagine. Way different from typical stars we see in our own galaxy or in galaxies nearby. But that's of course a somewhat hypothetical explanation and it doesn't really have much proof behind it, especially any theoretical proof in regards to population 3 stars. So for now, it's just a really big mystery. These galaxies seem to be way too bright, way too powerful and seem to be located in the universe where we don't expect anything like this to exist just yet, for at least a few hundred million years. We do see very powerful quasars and very powerful starburst galaxies hundreds of millions of years after that, but not so early on. So I guess maybe the other explanation here is that maybe there's a mistake somewhere, but it doesn't seem so yet. So this requires some follow-up studies and some follow-up observations. With all of this very likely being answered in the next few years by the incredible James Webb Telescope that's still currently warming up 
and getting ready for its first images. And so I guess until we discover something else, or until we figure out what's happening with these two galaxies, HD1 and HD2, that's all I wanted to mention. We'll definitely be coming back and talking about this in some of the future videos, so make sure to subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, and come back tomorrow to learn something else. Support this channel on Patreon by joining the channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye bye.